Imagine owning a home or service plot. Enjoying the sunrise and sunset from a beautiful garden. Morning hugs and beautiful moments with your loved ones. The never ending stories. Beautiful memories that will last a lifetime. Making and sharing great moments with family and friends. You can turn this into a reality. All you need is a tough home. Welcome to the Tough Hub. This is a brand new show brought to you by Tough Africa Global to educate you on real estate business and all the information you need to know about real estate. After 45 years of construction and real estate development in eight African countries, it is time to share my experience and it can only be done in the Tough Hub. We will be inviting experts who will give you facts and the right regulations on real estate development. Join us every week on our social media platforms for an exciting show. You can also watch us on JRTS TV every Sunday at 8.30 p.m. Hello viewers, welcome to the Tough Hub. This is a continuation with uh, Mr. Kevin Ta. Mr. Njai, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Maria. Mr. Ta, welcome back. And, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us on this second episode. Thank you. On legal issues on um, uh, as far as land matters are concerned yeah. or the real estate industry in the Gambia. Thank you. Thank you so much for yes. your time yes. and of course from the previous show you did discuss very important issues mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to freehold and uh, communal land as well. Yes. But my question is, uh, leasehold titles superior than freehold um, or communal titles? Uh, they're all different. Uh, they all have the different benefits and, and, and pros and cons. Mm -hmm. But if I had to rank them, I'll rank freehold at the top, and then I'll almost rank um, leaseholds and communal properties on par, subject to certain caveats, which I'll explain. Freehold property is the most superior form of property ownership. Freehold property, the owner holds the land in perpetuity. You own the land forever without any conditions, and you're free to do whatever you want to do with the land as far as it doesn't affect the rights of other third parties. And in Gambia right now, we have very limited freehold uh, properties which are mostly restricted to Banjul and parts of Cape Point. That's where you have freehold property. Now leasehold property obviously is less superior to freehold because leasehold property as the name says you don't own the land it's simply leased to you so you're a tenant you're a tenant for government and most leasehold tenancies have a lot of conditions most commonly you cannot assign without um, the consent of the minister uh, there's restrictions on how quickly you can build. Once you get an location, you have to probably build within two years. And there are restrictive covenants in terms of what you can put on the land and what you cannot put on the land. And failure to meet one of these conditions could result in you losing your, your, your property. For example, uh, what a lot of people are not aware of, and I hope they become aware of today, is that with a leasehold property, if you fail to pay your land rent for a single year, the government has the right to re-enter and take possession of the property without giving you notice. Wow. So that's the risk with the, with the leasehold property. Mm -hmm. Now communal land, as I said, I put it on par with leasehold property, but then it's both ways. Now communal land, when it's held by the indigents, that's the real uh, people of the community, when it's held by the indigents, it's a very strong title because then the community holds it, they hold it forever. As long as it stays within the community, they can own it and they can deal with it in whatever way they deem fit because it's subject to different laws. However, once the indigent or the original owner of the land transfers it to a third party, then that protection or the superiority of the land reduces in the sense that the third party owns just, for example, insecure title. For example, you have just what we call our Kahlo papers, which do not really vest ownership in you, and uh, you could be uh, dispossessed of your ownership at any time. Now, if you take steps to perfect your title, and as I've explained previously, that's by going to the district authority to obtain a lease, then you're more secured and I'll put you on par with a state lease and provincial lease on the same level. So you have freehold, communal land, and a state lease. Interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent. I mean, now, now, now Mr. Tara, um, um, when is the contract ratified? 
Because what, what happens actually in practice mm, yes. is that real estate agents or developers, what mm. they do, they prepare a sales agreement, okay. which is a contract between the buyer and mm. the seller. Yes. And once, once it's prepared, normally it is sent to the buyer, it's prepared mm -hmm. by, the, by, the, by the developer or the agent, mm -hmm. sent to the buyer you know, for his or her signature. Yes. And now, um, uh, is it, when, is, when is it binding? When, when it is sent to the lawyer or when the signature is, um, uh, is, um, is, is put. Is an, yeah. So simply put, I would say it's when it is signed, when it's executed by the other party. But generally, the effectiveness of a contract will depend on the terms contained in the contract. So usually you have a signature clause which will say this contract takes effect from the date of signature. If you have such a clause, then it takes effect from the day and time at which the buyer signs the contract. If you have a provision, for example, I know very often in the real estate sector, uh, you do mortgages or you do uh, staggered payments. Where, for example, you buy, you give an advance and then you pay over a period of time. But then you have a sales agreement. Now, the sales agreement may state that uh, this contract shall become valid upon payment of the final installment. So in that scenario, although it has been signed by both parties, it doesn't come into effect until the fulfillment of the conditions within it. So it again, you need to look at the terms of your contract. You need to look at the provisions contained in the contract because that is what will give you an indication of when the contract takes effect and when it is valid. But further to this, I mean, again, you walk into an office and then you are given a contract, you're given yes. a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And again, this is legal. Yes. What, what's your advice? Because, um, look, this is a, it's a legal title, you're yes. going to part with money. Yes. And uh, the purpose of this is to enlighten the buyers mostly, mm. to give them their rights. Yes. Because we hear quite a lot of disputes on buying land. Yes. So can you please just, just speak to uh, the clients out there yes. that when they walk into an office and intend to buy a parcel of land, mm -hmm. an agreement is given to them, to them. So what should they do before they put that signature on the piece of paper? Uh, I cannot stress it enough. Always seek legal advice. Always seek legal advice. So it's important for you to understand your rights, understand your obligations under the law, but it's very important that you also seek the advice of somebody whose job it is to, to know these things. Because I always like to say, the ultimate end of that dispute will be at the law office. So you rather start with the law office than end at the law office. Because if you venture into these transactions yourself without seeking legal advice, God forbid when any dispute arises, you will end up at the lawyer representing you in court in a dispute. So why not start with legal advice? Don't be too smart. Seek the, seek the services of a lawyer, get advice, and then go into a, your transaction with much more confidence. Yeah, I think it's worth it. Uh, you're not wasting your money if you hire a legal person to advise you before yes. you go ahead in signing that contract. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about how complicated it is in obtaining a freehold land compared to a leasehold land or communal land. I think it's... It, Again, when you look at the superiority, I think as the superiority of the different land tenures goes down, the difficulty increases. Mm -hmm. Because with, com with, with freehold property, as I've said, it's owned by the person who holds the title in perpetuity. And he is, as the name, he's, it's a freehold. He's free to deal with it in whatever way he deems fit. So once there is an agreement between the buyer and the seller, every, all the conditions are met. So it's easy for the seller to convey that freehold to the, to the seller, to the buyer, without uh, the need for any complicated processes. Mm -hmm. However, when you go to a leasehold property, it's more complicated because then he's transferring an interest in the property and not the property itself. Therefore, there's a lot of steps that need to be taken. He needs to seek the consent of the real owner, that is the state, mm -hmm. through the Minister of Lands, before he can assign that property. And when it comes to communal land, it's a similar thing. If you're buying communal land from the Alcalo, from the original holders, it's pretty easy. It's very similar to how you acquire a freehold title. But then if you're acquiring communal land from an individual who has purchased from the Alcalo or who has secured a provincial lease, then the same processes apply. He has to seek the consent of the district authority before he can assign that particular property. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Tai, we know that, yes, look, um, taxes are paid in, in, in land transactions. Yes. Um, uh, what kind of taxes should one pay in obtaining, um, be it freehold, yes. 
um, uh, communal mm -hmm. or leasehold? What are the kind of taxes that are required mm -hmm. that must be paid yes. by the buyer? Mm -hmm. And also, let's also probably also be told the taxes that are supposed to be paid by the, by mm -hmm. the, by by the, the seller. seller. Yes. So in, under our current fiscal system, under our current uh, tax system, there are two main types of taxes that are applied to land transactions. You have the capital gains tax and you have the stamp duty. Now, capital gains tax is a tax on the gain made on the sale of a fixed asset, not just a fixed asset, but any asset like land, machinery, on assets that do not depreciate or that do not lose value. So when you sell a fixed asset, you pay you gain money because you're the seller. So because you've gained money on that sale, you have to pay taxes for that gain. That's why it's called capital gains tax. So the seller pays the capital gains tax. Now, the capital gains tax is calculated in two ways. Mm -hmm. The capital gains tax could either be 15% of the gain or it could be 5% of the sale price. Now, let's take, for example, you in 2010, you bought a property worth $500,000. Now, in 2021, you sold the same property for a million dollars. Now, what's your gain on that property? It's $500,000. Mm -hmm. So the percentage, the 15% will be calculated on that $500,000, which is, I think, $75,000. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to calculate it the other way around, you calculate 5% on 1 million, which mm -hmm. will be $50,000. So what they will do is they will take the higher of either calculation. Mm -hmm. If the 15% of the gain is higher than the 5% of the sale amount, then they will go for the 15% of the gain. So that's how capital gains is, is, is calculated and it is paid by the seller and not by the buyer. Mm. Now there's another tax which is called stamp duty tax, which is a sort of a transaction tax on land. It's a tax for the transaction documents and it's an ad valorem. Ad valorem means it's based on the value of the transaction. So whatever the value of the transaction, a tax of, in the case of land, a tax of 2% is put onto that transaction. So in the case of a tr land transaction worth a million dollars, 2% will be $20,000. And that 2% will be paid by the seller. Mm -hmm. Capital gains is paid by the seller and stamp duty is paid by the buyer. So those are the two main taxes. Now, when you come to communal land again, if there's a provincial lease, the same two taxes will apply. If it's a freehold conveyance, the same two taxes will apply. Yeah. But then sometimes in conveyances, which are at the communal level, there are certain council taxes and levies that will also be put on the transaction. Those will be paid to the area council. Thank you for that answer. We'll take our first break. When we return, the tough hop continues. We'll be right back. TAF Africa Global is the first and biggest private estate developer in the Gambia and presence in seven other African countries. We take pride in leading innovation in all spheres of real estate sector in the Gambia and beyond. As such, we are launching the development of the first smart and modern office and retail towers in the Gambia called TAF Twins. The TAF Twins is located in the heart of the Carnifing Institutional Area and 10 minutes drive away from Banjo. TAF Twins is designed to have five floors of office spaces ranging from 50 square meters to over 1,000 square meters with two elevators, central air conditioning, 24 hours electricity and water supply with the ground floor reserved for banking, supermarket, restaurant and coffee shop. For your bookings and reservations, please call now on 376-2333 or 776-2333. Thank you. Welcome back after that break. You are still watching The Tough Hop. My name is Maria Makuli and of course I don't host the show alone. I'm also here with Mr. Mustafa Njai. Welcome back after that well, break. Thank you very much, Maria Ma, and um, uh, thank you um, uh, uh, Mr. Ta for, for coming um, and um, answering to our uh, invitation. Yes. Um, as you all have been following the conversation here, very interesting and of course I hope you are all learning a lot from this. Now we talked a lot about some of the challenges, but again going back still on some of the challenges that legal practitioners face uh, when it comes to land issues in the Gambia. We'd like to know what challenges do legal practitioners face? I, I can speak mainly from my perspective as a public practitioner, as uh, representing government in matters and it, not very much from the private uh, practitioner perspective, but having litigated a number of, of land uh, disputes on behalf of the government, the, the main challenges that 
uh, we encounter, I could summarize this on the basis of the sorts of cases we encounter the most. Um, what we encounter the most in terms of land disputes is uh, duplicity of sales. So very often you have uh, the same piece of land being sold to, to multiple, uh, multiple buyers. That's very common. And this uh, happens a lot of time, as Mr. Jazz rightly said, at the level of communal land, because it's not subject to the same stringent measures of registration as leasehold lands. So it's possible to sell the same piece of land to multiple buyers. And, and the second uh, most common dispute is also land sales by people who do not have title. In, in law, they say you cannot give what you don't have. Mm. And so very often people sell land that does not belong to them. Mm. And, and just to, to take a little detour, my, my personal opinion has, uh, for this whole issue has to do with the, the sudden increase in the demand for land. And because people are really desperate to get land, they are very willing to cut corners in order to get the land. And I don't know if we were to take a detour from talking about the law and just talk about the reality on the ground. I, I feel like um, in, in recent time, land has become uh, sort of valuable as a store value mm -hmm. than in its intrinsic use, which is to build property or to own and to use as it's supposed to be for agricultural purposes. And this can be traced to you know the 80s and the 70s and the 60s when uh, a couple of savvy citizens invested in land and in later years were able to you know, sell land for, for profit. And, and land is one of those things which always appreciates in value. Land is a sure asset which always appreciates in value. And because of that, it's attractive as, as, as a mode of savings. So now we're getting a lot of middle income people who all of a sudden have disposable income which they feel could be put in land. And so there's now a race to own a lot of land. And because of that, people are very happy to cut corners. So somebody offers you a piece of land and it's in a good location. So because you're desperate to get the land, you might overlook certain due diligence steps that, that you usually overlook. Mm -hmm. So as a result of the hasty manner in which people procure land, one, people do not procure land from you know, recognized names, recognized uh, land uh, salespersons, recognized, recognized real estate companies, that have a track record of always delivering land which has proper title, then uh, it's unavoidable that they fall into these traps. A challenge legal practitioners face a lot of time is you have clients who are not willing to listen to legal advice. So a lot of the time you advise a client not to purchase a particular property for one reason or the other, but again, because they are desperate to get the land, they overlook the legal advice and then they proceed with the transaction and obviously uh, the results are always uh, negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, great. I mean, let, let me now continue from there because mm -hmm. we, really we know that you know, land disputes um, mm -hmm. um, is a major challenge now in the Gambia. Yes, yes it is. And um, uh, you answered part of this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what, what's going wrong? Uh, and what, what suggestions do you have for for, for the players, uh, meaning mm -hmm. uh, lawyers, purchasers, mm -hmm. agents, and also mm -hmm. also the the, the so-called uh, developers themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably in another episode we can probably identify and define the role of the different players. Yes, sure. You know, uh, mm -hmm. because in other countries um, there is a responsibility given to a developer or a contractor, somebody mm -hmm. who builds, or an agent. But in this case here, I don't think it exists in the country. Mm -hmm. um, anybody opens up an office and calls his, himself or herself a real estate agent. They don't even put the word um, agent, they put a real, real estate, estate company, yes. company, real estate company. Mm. But there's a lot of disputes mm. and um, uh, talking from experience, uh, we go through all the search that is required. Mm. But yet still we go through some disputes, mm -hmm. you know, where we get, you know, recognized lawyers who will go through all this. But when it comes to physically being on the ground, where we think, okay, we've got all the required title, all the search has been done, it is now to move on site. Mm -hmm. But you move on site and you have major challenges, and are sometimes very physical. Mm -hmm. We've yeah. had people who throw, you know, rocks on you. I mean, even some will attack you and causing bodily harm. Mm -hmm. As a lawyer, mm -hmm. you know, your advice. I mean, yes. what's the way forward? I think first we need to look at the root of the problem, and and there are so many. I, we could we could spend forever looking at them, but I think it's twofold. I think one, there's a lack of understanding of the legal framework governing land 
ownership in Gambia. We have very excellent laws. We have very excellent laws. We, you look at volume eight of the laws of the Gambia, you have the State Lands Act, you have the Land Provinces Act, you have the physical planning regulations, you have the development control regulations. We have excellent laws, but there's a lack of understanding of our laws. And as a result of the lack of understanding, it breeds dispute. So to give you an example, when we look at communal land, as I've previously stated, the Kabilo holds communal land, but he holds the land for the benefit of his community, the Kabilo head. He holds the land for the benefit of the community. Now, some Kabilos, not all of them, you have Alcalos allocating land that belongs to the community and they hold the land as if it's their personal property. And as a result of that, although they have the power under communal law to allocate this land or to alienate this particular land, very often it's to the chagrin of the community because then fast forward 10 years down the road and that part of the community no longer has land and the surrounding areas have all been sold to third parties that they do not even know. So what happens? Although you as an individual has bought the land, it doesn't stop the community from trying to clamor to claim that the land belongs to them. So that's one of the issues. There needs to be clear definition of the role of the Kabilos and the traditional and the cultural rulers as holders of land for the benefit of the communities. I think another issue is uh, there needs to be more regulation of the real estate sector. Mm -hmm. And it's not just regulation on the part of government, but self-regulation on the part of the real estate companies. Uh, I think in recent years, we've seen a proliferation of real estate companies. At every street corner, we have a real estate company that has its benefits and its disadvantages. It's benefits in the sense that now land is more accessible to mm -hmm. people, but also the disadvantages are that when you have a proliferation of unregulated companies, it breeds the way to uh, all the problems that we are seeing right now. So I think the real estate companies have to come together and regulate themselves as an association, set their own internal rules and regulations and disciplinary rules, such that if you're not part of the association, uh, you, you have not if you're not recognized by the association, probably you're not allowed to exercise um, the profession of a real estate agent. We see this in the legal profession. The legal profession is regulated by the Bar Association. But how binding would that be? If, now, if, 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 like, yes. if, if, if the real, real estate practitioners come yes. together mm -hmm. and set in their rules yes. and you know, try to regulate it, yes. I mean, how binding is it? Because it's not, it's not been set by law. It, that's the whole point. Once, you have, once there is consensus and you have an association, then you lobby government and you get a law in place. So we need to lobby government. You need to lobby government. And so the regulator finally is government. The regulator will not be government. Government simply lays the legal framework for the existence of the regulator. Okay. But then the, regulator, the, the agency, so you have a government regulator one that regulates to ensure that the association is in line with the laws. But then you'll also have the association and its own internal rules and processes. Take, for example, the Medical and Dental Council. There's an act but then it's self-regulated. They set their own internal rules and procedures. So as a result, for example, if a particular real estate agency is involved in some sort of malpractice, it wouldn't be for the government to step in, but for the regulatory association to step in and carry out a disciplinary action on the particular entity. And that entity can be barred from, from, from practicing. You can also have a set minimum standards. For example, before you can sell land, the land has to have such and such titles because we, it's as a result of the lack of minimum standards for real estate companies, that real estate companies are allowed to sell land without proper title, without proper permits, without the proper uh, uh, power of attorneys, which appoint them as agents to dispose of the land. So I think the combination of the two things, a better understanding of the law, and I have to say that's where this program comes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's important in spreading awareness as to what the land, what, how to deal with land in Gambia, what the laws are. I think the more people gain awareness, uh, we'll see this dispute reduced. Definitely. This is a platform for people to learn from. And if you are planning to have your own real estate also, I think it is very important to also watch the show and learn from it mm -hmm. as we're bringing you experts from various sectors who would educate you on what you need to do and what not mm -hmm. to do. But that would lead us to another question still on real estate. Mm -hmm. When a real estate dispute arises, mm -hmm. is litigation mm -hmm. the only option? I would say litigation should be the last resort. Mm -hmm. Litigation should, the last, should be the last resort. I always suggest three different steps. The first step is you attempt an amicable settlement, and which means you come, you sit down with the company and you try to talk to them, or you sit down with the buyer and the seller, sit down, try to resolve the issue amicably. Now, if this feels 
if this doesn't succeed, you can go forward with mediation, structured mediation, where you have an independent third party who comes in and mediates between the two parties and tries to make them see uh, eye to eye. Because what happens very often is human beings by their very nature have egos. So sometimes disputes might arise that we could easily solve. But then if you don't have a third party who comes in to be the voice of reason, it's going to take more time for us to, uh, to resolve this problem. So one thing I'll suggest is in your land sales contracts, in your real estate contracts, always put an arbitration clause such that when a dispute arises, the parties can all resort to arbitration or mediation in order to resolve the dispute. And we've seen that very often, more than 60% of the time, mediation is always successful in solving land disputes before uh, you resort to litigation as a, as a last resort. Yes. Excellent. Mr. Ta, as we mm. come to the end, towards the end of the show, I mm -hmm. mean, uh, can you just give us some quick tips, you know, um, uh, that one should hit before purchasing a property? Yes, I think it will be a summary of everything I've already said. First mm. thing, first thing, seek legal advice when before you uh, commence a property transaction. Do due diligence, do a search, make sure one, the property itself exists, it's possible to buy ghost properties. Two, make sure that the person who's selling the property actually owns the property. Three, make sure that the property is not subject to a mortgage, it's not subject to an attachment, it's not subject to a lien, or it's not being put as security in a bank. Finally, make sure that uh, if the land is being sold by an agent on behalf of the real owner, the agent has the correct or the right power of attorney to dispose of the land on behalf of the, of the real owners. Yes. Well, excellent. Actually, for me, the, 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 the um, uh, best takeaway I have, mm -hmm. I have from your show, which actually um, I'm trying to take responsibility as uh, one of the biggest and the first real estate developers, mm -hmm. Um, is uh, the self-regulatory process that yes. you recommend. Yes. And uh, as recommended, I think the real estate um, association, I think there is one. Mm -hmm. there is. Um, there's a real estate association mm -hmm. uh, should come together and regulate itself. Yes. And then probably get government to, um, what would be the right word, to, um, to, to, to support it, yeah. yes. to support the regulations mm -hmm. Um, that are put in place for this association. Yes. And I think um, uh, in doing so, one way of doing it is by probably giving out a seal on a stamp on some registration. Yes. So if government recognizes this association, what will happen is that anybody who calls himself a player, a real estate company, you have to display a certificate from the real estate association. Yes. So you'll have a seal or a stamp and that's all, that can also bring up some, some revenue base. Sure. So you have to pay, mm -hmm. you know, to register. Yes. We probably will, will be able to run the office if yes. they have a lean office that they're running. Yes. I think that's an excellent one. Yes. Um, let me also draw some example from the French-speaking countries. Mm -hmm. You know, in the French-speaking countries, um, it's only a notaire. Yes. A notaire not, not, not public. Not a public one. That can, yes. you know, handle legal transactions on property or yes. sale. Yes. But anyway, on this program, uh, we're supposed to advocate and, um, um, and spearhead some initiatives that will improve the real estate sector. Mm -hmm. yes. I'd like to seize this opportunity to also tell everyone who's watching, because we have this Maslaha syndrome in the Gambia. If you are dealing with a real estate owner who you know, probably is a family friend or is a friend, you feel too comfortable not mm -hmm. to involve a legal person because you trust them. But that is fading away now because the people that you trust in the real estate business are the same people who are doing all these illegal actions. At the end of the day, you end up in dispute. Yes. So do not hesitate to hire a legal person to guide you through your process in owning a land in this country. This was an inter interesting conversation. Same here. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we have to end it now mm -hmm. uh, until we come your way on our next episode. My name is Mariama Kuli. I am Mustafa Anjai. And please don't forget to subscribe um, uh, to our to our channel on the link below. Taf Africa Global is proud to launch the Moria Gardens, conveniently located in Bruford, five minutes off the Bruford Highway. Moria Gardens is set to comprise of 20 fenced and gated service plots, with sizes ranging from 264 to 420 meters square. Unique features include water and electricity infrastructure solar streetlights, all-weather roads and scenic gardens. 
We offer a 10-year mortgage plan with a 25% equity down payment in partnership with GT Bank, Trust Bank and Echo Bank. For more information, please contact 376-2333 or 776-2333.